ticklish business any way you look at it. Come on, we'll stick together. Ticklish Business, the podcast devoted to honoring and deconstructing the world of classic cinema. I'm Kristen Lopez. I'm Kimberly Pierce. And we are joined by a very special guest, the amazing and talented and awesome Kim Karras. Kim, how are you? I'm great. What a nice chance to talk to you today. We are so happy to get to talk to you. We just did an episode a couple weeks ago. We did a Christopher Plummer tribute. So we were just talking mm-hmm. about you and the sound of music and how much I love the character of Gretel's. Very nice bit of fortuitous timing. Absolutely. Glad we could do this. question that I wanted to start off with is you were born in LA. What drew you into wanting to be a performer? I was never drawn into wanting to be a performer. (laughs) I grew up in a family of people who were incredibly talented musically and just across the board in terms of creativity. And I was a baby baby of the family by 15 years. So I grew up with a brother who had a magnificent singing voice and had a recording contract and beautiful songs written for him. And I grew up listening to his beautiful recordings. My sister was an actress and a dancer. My mother had had sung at Carnegie Hall, actually, when she was young and before she met my father. Wow. So I grew up in a household where performing was just what you did because that's what happened in the house. And I was pretty much a natural performer. I had an amazing memory, which I wish I still had. I, mean, I have a pretty good one now, but boy. Back then, I could remember anything at any time. And I was a good little mimic and I had a good sense of humor. So I grew up singing everything you can imagine just as a tiny little girl. But I had no desire to take it on the road. None. <laughs> <laughs> it was like that was what other people did. I was happy playing with my dolls and etc. My brother and sister had 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 an early acting career. And I think my mother sort of had that in mind for me. But I was having none of it. I think she took me to a couple of interviews when I was really little. And I said, no, basically. (laughs) And then I wouldn't do all the babyish things they wanted me to do because I was three and I was a young lady. So don't ask me to get on a hobby horse or do any of those undignified things. She gave that up. But it was meant to be because we were having lunch at my father's restaurant. My father had a restaurant at Vine and Melrose. and some producers were in there and came up to me and my mom. I think I was eating a cheeseburger at the time. And they said, oh my God, your little girl's so adorable, blah, blah, blah. Would she like to be in a movie? Would you like to have her be in a movie, et cetera, et cetera. And my mother said, you're going to have to ask her. So they asked me and I, I told them maybe if it wouldn't take too long because I was really busy and I had a lot of dolls to take care of. <laughs> so they loved that. And that was it. That's pretty much sealed my fate. And that was my first film that I did was a movie called Spencer's Mountain with Henry Fonda and Maureen O'Hara. I played their daughter. There you go. Spencer's Mountain and the rest was history. After Spencer's Mountain came the thrill of it all. And I didn't even have to meet anybody for that because Norman Jewison loved my performance in Spencer's Mountain so much. So I was Doris Day's daughter. And then I did a movie called Good Neighbor Sam and played Jack Lemmon's daughter. Then there was Sound of Music. Sound of Music, though, everybody had to audition regardless. And by then I was a veteran performer, like professionally as well. I think my favorite was doing the musical audition for it because I knew every single song. I knew every single song of every single musical, a Broadway musical ever by then. So wow. when they said, can you sing us something from Sound of Music? I said, well, which song would you like? They said, you choose one. And I sang 16 going on 17, which was so appropriate for a <laughs> five-year-old. I think I thought I was like 16 all the time, pretty much by then. That makes sense. That makes sense. I always felt at least 10 years older than I actually was as a kid. Lana Turner getting discovered in Schwab's. You getting discovered eating a cheeseburger. Those Albert, was, Albert Allen's was the name of the restaurant. Stories like that, it's great to hear them. They don't happen anymore. I don't even know how people get discovered YouTube. anymore. YouTube? I was going to say TikTok, yeah. maybe? That's such a Hollywood 
story, quote unquote, Hollywood story. Exactly. I know it's surreal almost as a thing. And, you know, I was very mature for my age, having my siblings were literally 16 and 15 years older than I was. So those were my peers to some extent. I think my mother, as much as she loved babies, loved more mature little people more. And I was certainly that such a strange Hollywood story. And there you go. It happened. Exactly. I wanted to talk about Spencer's Mountain for a second. I mean, that's a huge movie with Henry Fonda and Maureen O'Hara. Making that your debut, older people would be intimidated, you know, somebody who's like in their teens or something, but jumping into this as such a young girl and working with Titans, what was that experience like? Jump into the pool feet first. I was great at pretending. So if you just told me, like most kids, right, pretend this is your mother and your mother and father. These are your brothers and sisters. I really didn't think about it any more than that. I had lines to learn, but by then I was learning everything I could, like just a sponge. Lines were not a problem. They were only a problem once because I remember everybody else's lines too, (laughs) including Henry Fonda's. And a few times when he went up on his lines, I told him what they were. And I don't think he liked it. I was going to say, is he one of those that appreciated or did not appreciate that? (laughs) It could go go either way. I don't think he liked having a little three-year-old say, oh, blah, 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 blah. And he's like, oh, yeah, yes. I remember a few things. I remember Marina Hare was so breathtakingly beautiful. Yeah. I just found myself staring at her. My mother was very beautiful too, but she was a movie star beautiful. The makeup, the hair, the whole thing, even not playing a glamorous character. She was incredibly glamorous. And that gorgeous skin of hers that was just so luminous, she was just spectacular. I wasn't intimidated at all by Henry Fonda because he forgot his lines periodically. (laughs) But no, he was just like a dad person. I hated my costumes because they were all scratchy. I was a little tiny fashionista from super early on. So the costumes were like poor child in Wyoming, basically, costumes. They weren't the lovely little soft cottons and eyelets that I had loved by then. I was playing a character and that was great. And I fell in love with James MacArthur, who played my older brother. And in a bit of trivia, I actually dated him many, many years later, very briefly. Really? (laughs) Did you really? (laughs) I did. I did. I went backstage to see him. He was doing front page, the Mm -hmm. play in Palo Alto. And I went backstage to say hi. And that was the beginning of a little romance. But he was living in Hawaii at the time. And he wanted me to go to Hawaii to stay there and live there or whatever. So it was like, no, I didn't really want to do that. But he's a doll. That's so good to hear. (laughs) And a good kisser, I must say. (laughs) (laughs) You just made my Monday with that. This is why people come to listen to this show. We don't get a lot of kissing stories. You also had Delmer Daves doing the directing for that, who was big on melodrama, came to become synonymous with so many big melodramatic type of movies. Do you remember what he was like to work with as a director? Did that not even factor in? I do not. But since I'm apparently I'm in a super disclosing mood today, I may as well (laughs) tell you another story that pertains to that, which is there was a scene when I had to cry. Playboy, my brother was had raised his voice to me and I was supposed to cry. The plan was to do what they normally do for actors to make them cry if they're little kids, especially, is those glycerin tears that they put in your eyes. My mother decided to be really helpful and tell Dilmer Daves that I was really, really sensitive. So if anybody even raised their voice and I believed it, I would cry. And that's exactly what happened. James MacArthur made me believe he was really angry at me and I cried. So those were real tears. Wow. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's a wow story, right? <laughs> and like, that's and like, my, vicious my child mo- actor my stories. Mother, my mother was so wonderful, but she was of that generation that was like a little clueless on certain yeah. things. She would tell people that story. And I'd be like, mom. You cannot tell people that story. It's a bad story. It does not sound good. But I'm telling you that story because someone somewhere knows that story. And that actually got a mention by Luella Parsons, who was the really? big oh, yeah, gossip columnist at the time. 
who said I was the brightest child star since Shirley Temple. That's what happened back then. And that's ultimately led to the thrill of it all very, very much so. That story is not nearly as bad as when you hear about Natalie Wood's mother ripping up a butterfly in front of her or something to get her to cry. I mean, if anything, Hollywood's a really interesting microcosm of showing how parenting styles have changed, my theory. Oh my God, Uh, you can say that again, right? Right, absolutely. Well, the thrill of it all, anybody who listens to the show knows, one of my favorite movies. We're all big James Garner fans on the podcast. We talk about him a lot. To do that movie... You watch it now and it, it's saucy about gender Definitely. roles. Being a kid and just getting to play around Doris Day and James Garner, what were they like to work opposite, especially compared to Henry Fonda? It's funny because my attachments early on were really to my mothers, mm-hmm. my film mothers. I remember James Garner being very handsome, but that was basically all I really remember. Whereas I mm-hmm. remember Doris Day being just so beautiful and so smiling and so friendly and so warm. It was so easy to pretend she was my mom. It was also helped because Brian Nash, another right. wonderful child actor, played my brother. We bonded instantly. We became great friends. So that <laughs> added a whole other dynamic. I loved my costumes in that movie, by the way. Yeah. More fun to be the daughter of a doctor living in a beautiful house wearing adorable clothing. That was Exactly. Fun. I love that that movie is really just a slice of 1963 life. It's a great family dynamic of getting to see Doris Day being a mom who makes her own ketchup, which is a plot point that will always be fascinating to me. Why ketchup? Why are we doing ketchup? And you spend a lot of time getting your hair washed and getting dirty. It was kind of interesting because the dirt was obviously makeup. So I was fascinated. That began, I think, my love affair with makeup because they would mix this little pot of gooey, grease painty makeup and they would smear it on my face or they would smear it on my little cute little dress and it looked like dirt. I thought that was really fascinating myself. The bath thing was kind of interesting because they had to close the set. So Hmm. it was a closed set because I was naked. You have to see the movie completely unedited, edited, of course, but not cut for TV at all, because I'm naked and you see that I'm naked. And that's generally not something you see. The only time I've ever noticed that in a studio era film, probably meet me in St. Louis. There's a scene where the young girl is wet and you can see her backside through the outfit. It's pretty obvious. It doesn't happen a lot. It doesn't happen a lot. I unfortunately think that that little scene ended up on some borderline child (laughs) websites. One day, I don't know how I found that out, but somebody called me and said, you should know you're on some site called Child Starless, not porn. And I looked at it and it was kind of iffy. That's, I think, the terrifying thing about child stardom at any point in the history of film is we see now so many documentaries about exploitation and so many horrible things that we've known over the decades about child stardom, starting in the 80s, I think, is really when we started looking at it. But I think people tend to forget that classic film, there were a lot of child stars. Your parents had boundaries for you in terms of what you were doing on the set, off the set. I mean, what was that like? To know that you were both a child, but you were also in an industry that we're now looking at as what are the rules and and what are the boundaries for children? Well, you know, my mother was super, super vigilant. And I never had a problem with anybody at all until I hit my Lolita years. Yeah. (laughs) At 13, I started to have problems in terms of people trying to do things, but I had no problem before. Everybody I worked with was completely professional. And I don't even particularly remember the bath scene as being anything. It was like, oh, are you going to take a bath here? Okay. Yeah. By then, I loved Doris Day. She was a doll. So it was like, okay, fine. Pretend to wash my hair and give me a bath. It's okay with me. Yeah. And she was such a warm, maternal person anyway. Fine. Absolutely. It's only in the later years when I've heard people say things. I have one wonderful gay friend who carries around a picture of me from that particular scene. (laughs) He thinks it's one of the funniest things ever. He says, well, you did nude scenes back before. (laughs) Anyway, he's hysterical about it. 
and I do notice they edit it carefully when they show it on TV. It's there, but exactly. you'll see like my little tushy, which you do see in the full on film. It was just on this maybe about been. a month ago, and it is evident, at least on the TV that I yeah. was watching. So it's almost, innocent. It is. It's, so it, it's part of the narrative. Like it's not filmed in any salacious not way. At all. It just it just makes you realize how horrible certain parts of humanity are. Absolutely. They can take that and make it into oh, something inappropriate. It's tragic. It's yeah. tragic. And we definitely can't do that anymore. And we shouldn't. Yeah. Because oh, yeah. precisely because of that. I'm not one to really bemoan lost innocence. I know a lot of people do, but in that case, I listen to dialogue sometimes and I think, oh my gosh, of old movies. It was meant so innocently and in a million yeah. years, none yeah. of those things could be said now. It's exactly. so hard to yeah. judge evaluating things from a historical standpoint. You have to almost look at history in multiple different ways. You do. You absolutely do. Otherwise, pretty much nothing is readable or watchable anymore I mean, uh, from yeah. a different time. Back in school, it, how can we really evaluate history without having lived it? Because you have to judge things from so many different levels. You spoke about being such a mature child, being five going on 16. Do you feel like that helped you in your work in the industry, not being swallowed up? Absolutely. I think it helped that so many other things were interesting to me always. I loved reading. I mean, I started to read as early, I think, as it was possible to for me. And I loved reading. I loved all those imaginary worlds. I loved the world of science. I mm. loved my little backyard experiments with things and probably was that love of makeup too. Oh, you put this with this and it becomes that. I had wonderful friends. My family was so warm. My family's Greek. And so we are hugging, kissing, loving note writing people. That was super helpful too. And my parents thought that was all great that I was doing that, but it wasn't the be all end all. There were expectations for me. There was no tolerance of any bratty behavior. I don't think I was prone to it, but they wouldn't have let me anyway. We had a huge family at that. Our family was only the three of us and mom and dad, but we had all the relatives from Greece and who really never had merged into American culture. They were immigrants. They'd come at 20 or 30 and they stayed in their little communities. And mm -hmm. I was expected to be understanding and compassionate and include everybody, whether they fit into my little American view or my anything. I think those were important lessons too. So it definitely kept me grounded. After you work with Doris Day and James Garner, I know you did a movie in between there, which is Good Neighbor Sam. And it's interesting that Spencer's Mountain and this, you're uncredited, even though you are significantly in the film. I'm always fascinated by how they determine who gets credits and who doesn't on these movies. I actually haven't watched the credits in a long time, but the thrill of it all, I, I had a nice credit. You are, Brian. yeah. That's confusing to me that at Spencer's Mountain and Good Neighbor Sam, you aren't credited. I don't know who to complain to about that, but I feel like I need to. I feel it like just doesn't make too. sense. <laughs> I, I'm going to leave that to you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> to go from Doris Day to working with Jack Lemmon, who I've heard nothing but good things about Jack Lemmon being a very serious performer, but a gregarious guy. I mean, what was that transition like for you to go from Doris Day to working with him? I don't remember very much about Good Neighbor Sam for some reason. I don't know why, but I don't. I haven't seen it in a million years myself, but I do remember loving Jack Lemmon. Now that's the first okay. like dad-like person I remember loving. And here's my wonderful Jack Lemmon story. So many, many years later, I was having lunch at a restaurant called Ma Maison, which was kind of a oh, very yeah. popular, very popular watering hole here. And Jack Lemon was sitting and having lunch by himself. So I went up to him and I said, hi, <laughs> it's Kim Carath, blah, blah, blah. He said, oh, my goodness. So he asked me to join him for lunch. And we sat and had a wonderful, wonderful time. I don't know who I was with that I could have abandoned like that, but I did. <laughs> and I sat with Jack Lemon. must have been a very good girlfriend. We just had a wonderful, wonderful conversation. He said, please fill me in on your life. And I did. 
I think I had just graduated not too long before that from SC. So he wanted to know all about what I'd studied. And he talked so much about how important education is for everybody, for actors. Just so warm and so lovely. It was a real treat. He was a total wonderful gentleman. Yay! We joke on the podcast about trying to find the last good men of classic filmdom. And it's always good to find out that somebody that you hope is a good person is a good person. Because that doesn't always happen these days. No, it doesn't. But my experience couldn't have been more wonderful. So dignified, so warm, (laughs) just a doll. And then you transition to The Sound of Music, which is just I remember reading about the process of especially Broadway musicals being a big deal in the mid 60s as a means of trying to get people away from television and the sound of music being just this huge, huge process for you. I know you mentioned that you had to audition for it, but I'm assuming it was a series of audition progression. What was that process like? I remember sort of the initial one where there were 5 million kids, it felt like, in the waiting room at 20th Century Fox remember going in and meeting a lot of men, it was all men, of course. And the story goes from the other side of it, that when Robert Wise met me, he said, if he did not hire me as Gretel Von Trapp, he would have hired me as his secretary, because I was <laughs> so, so smart and so together and so efficient and so mature. That was his little story, very adorable. Anyway, they actually didn't really want to hire a five-year-old because the hours that a five-year-old could work were so limited. They kept looking around, but they kept the audition process going, obviously, with me as well. There was a musical audition. There were the screen tests. I did feel like they loved me and wanted me. And in the end, that's who they chose. They couldn't find anybody they liked that was older. And then they matched up the families. And That was kind of amazing because I ended up so incredibly close to to everyone, but specifically to Heather Menzies, who really became another sister. She's the godmother to your son, correct? She is my son's godmother. She was the witness at my second wedding. Her name's on our marriage license. It turns out that she actually was in elementary school with my current husband. Really? In Florida. Also, at one point, he was set to direct an episode of Logan's Run. Their paths never crossed in the way they did. They crossed, but not until me. And then the two of them just really completely loved one another. And Heather's in every moment of my life. He, Nikki took me to my first prom, Nicholas Hammond, who played what? Friedrich. I want to say when you did the TCM Classic Film Festival appearance, which feels like a million years ago... It was you and, and Heather Menzies and Debbie, right? Debbie Turner. Debbie, yeah. that's right. Yeah. And I want to say that we chatted very, very briefly in the long press line. I was probably still reeling from Julie Andrews talking to me for about five seconds. <laughs> so I don't remember what I asked you, but I know that I talked to all three of you very briefly and it was awesome. There was time spent in Salzburg to film. Three months. It looks- It looks beautiful on the screen. I can only imagine what it was like to actually be there. It really did start my love of Europe. I ended up living in Europe and going to school there for a little while. And my first husband was French. I'm not going to blame Sound and Music on him. There's no blame. (laughs) But my love for Europe really started with Sound and Music because I was spellbound, entranced, fascinated. We went to visit Mozart's birthplace, which is this home, his early home, which is in Salisbury. But that's, it's incredible. We went to castles. We, we just saw amazing things. And that love of history definitely got imbued in me at that point. And that beauty, that incredible beauty, paintings and buildings and sculptures. And it was overwhelming. It was wonderful. I read somewhere that your sister auditioned for the role of Liesl at one point. Is that a true story? It's it's not true. Okay. And my poor sister, every time she sees that, she's they did not audition for the role of Liesl. (laughs) It's just one of those things. I'm putting that on my to-do list. Figure out crediting and get that removed off IMDb. There you go. I got a to-do list. (laughs) There's going to be a long, long list. She did, however, come with me. My mother and my sister came during the filming. 
And my sister and the assistant director's son, who was the second AD, fell in love and they got married. They were only married for a year. And I like to say, he's the person who rescued me when I fell in the water and was drowning on that (laughs) scene. They had someone standing by in case all hell broke loose, in case something bad happened, which it did. So Alan jumped in and saved me. I sort of like to think there was a little bit of her gratitude for his saving me that led to that (laughs) in love thing. Didn't last long, but it was, I think, the romance of Salzburg too. And he was very handsome and very beautiful. And there you go. Exactly. Together in that setting, how can you not? It's kind of a brew. When we did our Sound of Music episode, we talked about Christopher Plummer really had to reconcile with the movie over the years, that he was not a happy camper when he made it because he felt that the character was very reductive and he slowly grew to love the movie eventually. Do you remember what he was like to work opposite? I don't remember. He just was very handsome and very professional and super likable, but not warm and cozy like Julie. I mean, Julie was just so, so warm. But boy, Chris made up for it later. He really did whatever he felt about it. Certainly, it was never evident in the way he treated any of us while we were filming or in the years later. I hadn't seen him in many years, and I had a chance to see him. After 9-11, there was a benefit performance for the firemen and a lot of the essential workers in Westport, Connecticut at the Westport Country Playhouse, which is just a brilliant old red barn of a classic summer stock playhouse. Somebody told him I was there. I was asked to go backstage afterwards. So I went backstage. I was greeted by Paul Newman, who literally, and Joanne Woodward, who said, your father's waiting for you. He's been facing the floor. And they escorted me to Chris Plummer, who threw his arms around me and said, oh, my daughter, you know, the sweetest, most lovely. So I spent some time with him backstage. It was a completely unforgettable experience. He asked me to go visit him and his wife. They had a house in Westport, but I never ended up doing it because I was starting a divorce. It was like a long drawn out thing. But I saw him many years later, a couple of different times. It was always wonderful. He made a lot of special time to spend with me. Okay. As somebody who has now been diving into the work of Paul Newman since the pandemic started and is vaguely obsessed, I have to ask, he was awesome in person, right? Awesome. Absolutely breathtakingly (laughs) handsome. However old he was, I don't know. It was right after 9-11, so do the math. He was breathtakingly handsome, so warm, so down to earth. He and Joanne Woodward were a crack up together. She was wearing this hat and she said, my husband hates my hat. What do you think? And he was laughing and she was laughing. And I said, oh, I don't know. I don't think it's that bad. And she said, see, she doesn't think this hat is that bad. Anyway, they were so funny and so cute. And he was just exactly what you think he'd be. Good. Uh, good. Yay. (laughs) I know. Isn't it a yay when that's the case? Right. Celebrate moments like that. The Sound of Music, there's so many stories that have been told about it. You almost drowning. I mean, is there a Which is true. Which is true. (laughs) I just rewatched the movie when we did the episode and I was like, that looks incredibly dangerous and frightening. And I can only imagine being an adult and almost drowning, like let alone being a child. Is there a moment for you, either a scene or just something behind the scenes that still sticks out to you after all this time where you're like, damn, I was there for that. I can't believe that's me. I never have the, I can't believe it's me because I can never forget it's me. (laughs) I've never been allowed to forget that it's me. To this day, if anyone ever finds out, I'm a friend immediately to them. I hear about (laughs) how they used to watch it with their mother or grandmother or with their children in every corner of the world, it seems like. I will tell you, Sound of Music, I said it on the episode we did, Sound of Music was an act of rebellion for me because my mother despises it. And so I watched it just to irritate her. I know a lot of people that watch The Sound of Music as a way of being an angsty teenager against their parents who aren't fans of it. It's a weird way to get into the movie. That is so interesting. I have never heard that. 
in all the yeah. years, I've absolutely never heard that t- that spin. I like that too. It's interesting. Thank my mother. I was forced to watch it every Easter with her family. That was the only option that they had as a kid. So as she came to grow up, she was like, if I never have to watch that again. Now, if I turn it on because it's a yearly thing for me, she'll be like, nope, I can't. I won't do it. So I haven't convinced her. I'm slowly trying to break her down to maybe watch it again. It's like a fun bonding thing. Okay, that's an absolute first. Never heard it. That is amazing. (laughs) Yay! I'm happy to give you that. (laughs) Yes, you did. Make a girl trip someday to Stowe, Vermont. That may change her perspective a little bit. Okay. Because I think what people who are, I'm not that everybody has to love sound and music, but what I think of many people don't really understand, even people who love it, that the most remarkable part of that movie was the true story upon which it's based. Right. That is the most remarkable thing, which is this family that were incredibly courageous and brave in the face of freaking Hitler. They were not Jewish. They did not have to take Mm -hmm. a stand. They took a stand. They left everything behind. They rebelled. They rebelled. Georg von Trapp, was a massive hero. He said no to Hitler. Hitler requested three things at three different times. And he said no each time. And finally, somebody said to him, some friend said, you can't just keep saying no to Hitler. So they left. I think that family was incredible. And if you go to Stowe, Vermont, you see these incredible black and white pictures of them learning how to care for a farm. They came and they sang. That's how they made enough money ultimately to buy this place in Vermont where they settled. But they milked cows and mapled trees, started from scratch. They had, I think, some ridiculous amount of money when they came to the U.S. And it was only the Catholic League, I think, that helped them a little bit. They are amazing people. And I've had the opportunity to go to Stowe to meet some of the real Von Trapps. It's really an awesome thing. I wasn't aware of that really when I was a little girl. So I wasn't as aware of that. I became more and more aware of it over time. And for me, that's the most profoundly meaningful thing. When I went to Stowe, I went and visited Martina's grave. That's the Gretel. Gretel Mm. was Martina. And she died, I think, in childbirth or very soon after she and her baby died. It's just sort of interesting realizing was a historical character, even though it's this frothy musical, there's a huge amount of depth. So take your mom to Stowe. And if she's interested in seeing how people survive in the face of making a moral choice that many didn't. It's going on my list. We're already starting the post-pandemic travel list. I'm adding it to there. And then maybe I can convince her to give the movie a second chance free of Easter memories. After Sound of Music, you dabbled in television after that. And then You took a break to pursue your education. After making The Sound of Music, one of the biggest musicals of that time, for you, still being so young, was there an expectation to top that? What did you want to do after? Go to school and have fun with my friends. Mm -hmm. (laughs) One of the interesting things is I'd made three movies before and was just an actress working, whatever, in between playing and visiting with relatives and stuff. And then Sound of Music happened and I was famous. And that was something that was a little bizarre because there was fan mail and a little scary sometimes. The fun part was fan mail from all over the world because I loved the stamps and I loved seeing postmarks from Finland and Uruguay and all those places I could barely pronounce too. I got Uruguay and Paraguay. Wow. Uh, Wonderful fan from Japan for a really long time. So all that worldwide thing was very fun. The thing that was not fun were some scary people. I had a fan drive from the Midwest to be there for my seventh birthday. Somehow he found my address and it was a grown man. I know Heather and Angela, there was a guy who got an ice cream truck near where they lived in Burbank to stock them. That and kids at school were mean. So that was not fun. Luckily, I made other friends who weren't mean, but there was a lot of bullying going on for a long time that was like, for what? It's ridiculous. And even my parents would say, well, they're just jealous, but who cares when you're little? You just want friends. 
Right. You don't, exactly. care, why, you don't care why they're being mean. If you're not mean, because I wasn't, I guess if I'd been a little tougher kid, it would have been easier, but I was never a tough kid. I had asthma, I had a super high IQ. So they sent me off to special high IQ classes at the time. They skipped mm-hmm. me a bunch of grades. So they hated me for that. I was not athletic because I was asthmatic. So I had a target on my back for a long time. People who were young in the industry in the 90s, I've asked them about, can you imagine doing this in a time before social media and Twitter and, and all of this? And they say no. Can you even imagine being a child star at this point in an era before social media? Hearing these stories, it's always shocking to me, the tenacity of, I'm going to say weirdos, but I can only imagine what that would be like with Twitter and Facebook. It's hard to even imagine. I do know my parents would have kept all all of that away from me as much as Mm -hmm. they could have, you know, and I was pretty small at that point. So I don't think I would have fought them on it, but I don't know. But in any case, after Sound Music, I did a lot of TV. I basically Mm -hmm. was in every TV show of that time. Everything from My Three Sons to Lassie and Playhouse 90, The Family Affair, which I did a bunch of different times. Brady Bunch was the last of the TV things at the time, and I was 13. It was really interesting because I was very developed, and they had to figure out a way to have me look younger. They didn't want to go full on baby Raquel Welch. So I literally had to go in the producer's offices. I'd go with wardrobe. They'd figure out some way to flatten me a little bit and baby me up a bit. And it was so embarrassing. It was at that age. It was weird. And they were so nice, but it was strange. But I had lots of fun on the set. It was a fun thing to do. And I think that was a little bit of a turning point because right after that, some scary things happened to me. And my parents said, okay, I think that's it for now, which was fine with me. I went to Marlboro, which is a wonderful girl's school. Oh, yeah. I think everybody was happy to have mm-hmm. me at a, at a girl's school too. It was a super protective environment and I loved school and I had wonderful friends and I didn't miss anything in that period of time. I did a couple of things. I did a Waltons, but I was bombshelly and young. Now I think people would use it differently, but there are so many horrible people that gravitate toward very young girls. Yeah. And they gravitated toward me and my parents were horrified. And so that, that became the education time. I was watching a documentary that Soleil Moonfry did about her time at growing up. She was Punky Brewster. Mm-hmm. And she has a very similar trajectory of the minute she started to develop into adolescence and becoming a teenager, the roles pivoted and it became more about emphasizing her looks and her bust and objectification and all of these things that she didn't even think of. And it's amazing how we've become more aware of the objectification of young women in society. And yet, it's a, but yet it's a tale as old as time. It keeps coming. And as somebody who writes about it, I'm so sick of hearing it. Cause I'm like, can't we just change things? Can't we just make it better? Can't we just stop objectifying women? That would be great. It would be great. And it's got to happen. And there's such a victimization with girls at those really delicate ages. They're not women. A 13 and a 14 year old is not a woman by a long shot, nor is a 15 year old or a 60. I mean, they're girls, period. It was very, very, very scary at that particular period of time. It took my parents a little bit to catch on that things were about to go very south. But when they did, they just said, okay, let's just stop that. I know you have a son. If he wanted to get into the industry, is that a conversation that you would be willing to have for him? It's funny. Many years ago, Heather and I did an interview with, I God, I don't remember who it was. It was one of the big networks. That interview never got aired for some reason. I don't know what happened, but my son was probably five at the time. And someone asked me that question. And I had not talked publicly about the fact that my son has special needs at that point. Mm -hmm. And I literally, it was good. It wasn't live. I started to cry during the interview and they stopped tape because my son can't speak. He's almost 30 now. And I'm not at the stage where I'm going to cry just thinking that. (laughs) By the way, he's magnificently beautiful. He's absolutely perfect looking and everything. He is perfect. He had a stroke when he was 
a few weeks old that impacted brain and cognition. It's difficult. I use a wheelchair. I'm disabled myself. My parents, I'm the only disabled person in my family. That question of raising a child with special needs and wanting to be encouraging, but also knowing that there's challenges and it's different. It's a different experience. I get you. You clearly do. I did not know that. And, you know, <laughs> oh, no, I mean, no. Different with Eric because language is, yeah. you know, language oh, yeah. is everything. But he's so beautiful. I've, many people have asked over the years before they realized he had any kind of challenges. Do you want to have him be a model? Blah, blah, blah. What about him? I was like, at some point, somebody stopped me and said, what about runway modeling? And I said, what about runaway modeling? Because <laughs> he'd be gone. I'm glad we're talking about this. My son is a natural performer. Here's the mm -hmm. interesting thing. With all the verbal stuff that isn't there, he sings and he dances. He is extremely charismatic. I do think looking at him, so he's like, he would have been the perfect movie star. Yeah. He's movie star handsome and movie star charismatic. So I probably, as much as I don't encourage children to do it, I think my son, by the way, if everything had been perfect and normal, I would never have encouraged him to be a child actor. Never. It's not that it was so horrible for me. It's not that I feel like I'm scarred or I'm not. In fact, it stood me in good stead in my life. It takes away other choices, other options that a child mm -hmm. might choose yeah. for themselves in a different way. In the irony of my life, when I was a little girl, a baby, and before the film business came knocking. My description was I want to be a baby doctor. Wow. And mm -hmm. there's an irony because I've had to be that and more for my son. Yeah. Our joke around the house is I'm Eric's personal physician and et cetera, et cetera. But I never would have made that choice for him. And I guess if it had come knocking, we would have done what my parents did. Education is super, super important. And these businesses lead to a lot of fragility. It's unstable. Even at its best, it's unstable. I was reading Sharon Stone's memoir recently, which is wonderful. Yeah. Just seeing how things changed for her, frankly, because she had that physical problem and also her thing had that brain, oh, yeah. whatever yeah. happened that was so terrible. But also because as actresses get older, things change. It's not a stable thing. Mm -hmm. My son's neurologist was a woman, and she was in her early 80s. Back, of course, when she'd gone to med school, another neurologist told me she was the only woman in both the med school and the neurology department. But she still has a career. Things are changing. They're better. You have yes. older actors oh, yeah. with really good roles. But it's taken a really long time. As somebody who writes about the need for more disabled performers in the industry, if your son ever changes his mind, I keep banging the drum for we need more disabled performers. You're absolutely right across the board. No Wait. doors should be closed. Mm -hmm. None. 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 No, no. I have no idea how to transition from that. Kim, oh. do you have any questions you want to throw out? Mine feel really fluffy <laughs> after that. That's okay. You can, you know, we can go back to fluff. It's how I live my life. I go into the I, deep end and then I go into the shallow end. It was this, such an amazing discussion here. You've had such amazing roles and, you know, starting with the TV stuff. Was there a specific role you can think of that you were just excited to get? That's like, I can't believe I'm going to be a part of this. I pretty much took everything for granted. I mean, I enjoyed it all and I did my best, but it was not something I was hungry for. Right. And interestingly enough, after I graduated from SC, I went back to acting. It wasn't that I necessarily had been convinced that I was going to, but my father passed away my sophomore year of college. It really upended our, our entire family. And it wasn't the time to go on with extended education. It was mm -hmm. the time to work. So I went back to acting and it was the heyday of the dumb blonde, TNA dumb blonde. I fit the bill basically. So that's what I did. I did stupid shows. I mean, they were nice shows, but I played basically bimbos for a little while. And the only auditions I ever had were fundamentally for bimbos or for taking my clothes off in a super exploitative way. And then I was harassed constantly. It was a constant casting couch nightmare, just like everything that came out with Me Too. Literally somebody saying, how much do you want this part? How am I going to distinguish 
between you and any of the other actresses who right. also want this part. So I got really, really sad. And because I spoke French and because I was mm -hmm. young, I decided to go to Paris where I thought the film business was run differently and they made deeper, more meaningful things. And just because whatever, just because a girl was bombshelly, they wouldn't necessarily just cast you mm -hmm. that way, which was naivete on my part. But I got a great agent in Paris who said, do you have a work permit though? Which of course I hadn't even thought oh, about no. uh -huh. because I was 24. So instead I stayed, I went on a few auditions that weren't that great. And I fell madly in love. It was springtime. Mm. It was Paris, Paris fell yeah. in love and ended up staying and going to Ecole de Louvre for a little while, which was the art history that school that connects to. That's that was fun. But I, my French wasn't quite good enough to go very far in Ecole de Louvre. It was a great time. I lived in Europe, got married. Then when I came back, I worked on all my children, which was fun. That actually was a fun thing, but it wasn't mm -hmm. for very long. And I probably was going to be brought back, but then I got pregnant and I wanted to have a child really badly. And I had Eric and my life changed. There was never anything I was dying for, anything right. that I would have given up everything for. Even in this period of time, I made a choice to be with my son. And just to bring you up to current, I ended up doing a TV show, which I'm really proud of, which only got picked up by JLTV, which is called Bouncing Back. And it's about resilience. It's on YouTube. That was one of my favorite things to do. That was like a pilot for, mm -hmm. we did two episodes, it was a pilot for that. And I wrote a screenplay, which hopefully will get financed. Bruce Beresford, my favorite director, except for Robert Wise, is directing. <laughs> We were fully financed twice. Financing is always the key thing, but we oh, had our yeah. cast. We have Catherine Deneuve playing Madame de la Roche. It's, it takes place in Paris. Mm -hmm. And we've got our line producers. We're ready to go on this. So I'm pretty excited to do that. And I can figure it out with Eric. He's going to come with me to France. His family's there. It'll work out. We just need the rest of our money. I'm excited to see this. I need it to get made so that I can go watch it, preferably in a movie theater when the world makes sense again. Absolutely. <laughs> Kim, we want to thank you so much for thank sitting you. down and talking with us. Where can fans find you online? They can find me on Twitter and they can find me on Instagram. And it's just me, Kim Carath. I'm fairly vocal about my views on Twitter. I'm not aggressive, but I'm fairly vocal. <laughs> Always a good thing, yes. <laughs> That'll close out this edition of Ticklish Business. As always, if you want to send us your comments on Kim Carrick, A Sound of Music, whatever you want, you can email them to us at ticklishbiz at gmail.com or you can tweet them to us at ticklish underscore biz and we'll read them on the next episode. You can always find me on Twitter at journeys underscore film. Kim, what's going on with the website? What's going on with you? Where can people find all of that online? You can find me personally at kpierce624, both on Twitter and on Letterboxd. Spend most of my time anymore over on the Ticklish Business website, journeys at classicfilm.com. We'll have some pre-code stuff going up throughout the rest of April here. Always have some delightful B-movie reviews dropping every week or so that are just a blast to watch. And I've been working on the Ticklish Business Letterboxd account as well, ticklish underscore biz. And that's at journeysinclassicfilm.com. So Thank head on you. over there. We also have our Instagram account over at Ticklish Biz, where you can see all sorts of cool pictures. We are once again reminding you, we have a contest we would love to start off. If we hit a thousand followers on either Twitter or Instagram, we will be giving away two copies of a rare out-of-print Fox box set as well as a full set of Kate Gabrielle's TCM Classic Film Festival designed pins. We're adding a bunch of stuff. So please help us out. Start following us on social media if you aren't already. And we will be hopefully giving those away soon. We also have our Lois Weber box set coming to a close. All you have to do is find the tweet. We will be retweeting it throughout and tell us who your favorite female filmmaker is and you can enter to win that of course those contests are for u.s residents only sorry international people that's going to close us out for this week till then <laughs> <laughs>